here is this is going to um if you open up your Shadur and go to page 177 you'll actually see uh the six remembrances that we're required to constantly remember uh so the first one is the remembrance of the exodus from Mitzrayim as you might know that all of our um Shabbat festivals anything like that that's pretty much Zecher uh, 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 yeah, so, uh, yeah. so, so the the leaving of of Egypt right uh second one is remember the receiving of the Torah of Sinai the third one is the remembrance of Amalek right okay so that is actually where you're going to find the source to all this to where we're about to talk about uh, the God of Amalek is actually the God of happenstance or the God of, in, um, you know, causality. Like there's, there's, there's basically Amalek's God was that there is no God who controls everything. Everything is just random. That is Amalek's God, right? So I'm about to show you how to see this and actually comes from this verse from the remembrance. So it says, this is Deuteronomy 25, chapter 25. Uh, verses 17 through 19. So we'll read it in the English first. It says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you departed from Mitzrayim, how he encountered you on the way and cut down the weaklings trailing behind you while you were faint and exhausted, and he did not fear God. It shall be when Hashem your God lets you rest from all your surrounding enemies in the land that Hashem your God gives you as a heritage to bequeath you are to erase the memory of Amalek from beneath the heaven. Do not forget. So this is actually a big, big mitzvah, right? So I pulled up some verses here, and I want—I just want to show you in the Hebrew, so y'all can y'all can see this and better understand what's being said here. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Hang on. How do I share my screen? Share screen at the bottom is green. Okay. It's not registering. Hang on. There we go. You will not be able to point out your answer to those quotes. Oh, okay. Hang on. <laughs> do you want me to share it for mine? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, where are you at? Go to so pull up for me if you don't mind. Pull up Bible Hub Deuteronomy 25 17. Do you just need the Hebrew? Or are you gonna go into the actual I'm gonna the word? I'm gonna go I'm gonna go in first. Well actually go to go safari pull up uh first Samuel 15 2. And then I'm, I'll just read from the screen. Oh not Deuteronomy. Yeah, pull, we'll pull up this one first, because the other thing we need to understand is why why is Haman called the Agagite, right? Because um, Haman actually descends from Amalek, as, we, as we're about to find out, right? 15, so 15, yeah, 1 Samuel 15, 1, we'll just start there. 15, 1. Okay. Okay, so Shumuel said to Shaul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. Therefore, listen to Hashem's command. This actually was a hop tour not that long ago. I think it was like last week. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I am exacting the penalty for what Amalek did to Israel for the assault he made upon them on the road on their way up from its rhyme. It says, now go and attack Amalek and proscribe all that belongs to him. Spare no one, but kill all alike, men and women, infants and sucklings, Oxen, sheep, camel, and asses. It says Saul mustered the troops and enrolled them at Tiliam, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. Then Saul advanced as far as the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the wadi. Joel said to the Canaanites, come withdraw at once from among the Amalekites that I may not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all of the Israelites when they left Egypt. So the Canaanites withdrew from among the Amaleks, the Amalekites. Shaul destroyed Amalek from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is close to Egypt, and he captured King Agag of Amalek alive. 
Keep it scribe. So this is where Aga guy. This is where this is if if Shaul had not kept him alive. So this you notice that scripture says he captured King Agag of Amalek alive. All right. So he did not kill. He was supposed to kill everybody, but he kept this king alive. Haman in the in the uh, the story of Purim is called uh, the son of Abadas, Hamadasa, the Agagite, because he descends from Agag because he was kept alive. If King Shaul would have killed him in this instant and not kept kept him alive, we would not have the story of Purim, or at least not have Haman. Mm. Uh, so he was supposed to kill the king Agag. The sages say that this night that he kept him there because Shaul comes the next morning, or Shaul. Um, Samuel. Samuel comes the next morning. Shmuel, he comes the next morning and says, "You know the whole what's this bleeding I hear in my ears? You didn't listen to a sham. You know the kingdom has been ripped from you. All all these things, of which I'm not going to go into all that. But I just wanted to show that the sages say, or our sages say, I should say, that that King Agag had relations with his wife that night and conceived, and Haman was conceived this night." Uh, later on, we're also going to find out Shaul here. So here's here's the other the other, other cool part of this of the of Purim is Shaul's descendants are Mordechai and Esther. So we kind of see a tikkun in the Purim story that well, Shaul's descendants are actually going to tikkun the job and get rid of get rid of Haman. Wow. So Goodness. so let's go to. Let's go to Deuteronomy 25, 17. Let's just pull up the Hebrew on this. And actually, let's go to 25, 25, 18, because 17 basically says, remember what Amalek did to you while you're on the way as you departed from Mitzrayim. Exactly. Okay, so again, this is the mitzvah to remember what Amalek did. All right, so in 25, 18, yeah. can you pull it up on the uh, on Bible Hub? Because I want to I want to show them the, oh, you wanna do the yeah. Background? Because look, if you do this one, mm -hmm. mm, where is it? This word here, kara. Uh, come on. Okay, so we'll wait for a minute. No, we're good. 25, 18. 25, 18. So that's what I'm going to show you guys why Amelik. Because it says the way it says it, it says how it says, okay, it says how he met you on the way. Now, this, this, word, this, way. so this, this word, kara, the second word here, asher ka, kareha, right? So this word here, he met you, it's not really an accurate translation, but let's, let's go ahead and click on it. And then look, it says in, encounter, meet, befall, right? So let's keep going down a little bit here. Misfortune specifically. So this really has to do with, this whole idea of misfortune, right? Oh, um, where is that it? It's up here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, misfortune specifically. What? So this word is already alluding to, like uh, this, like this kind of happenstance. This mis it's, uh, all this whole misfortune thing, right? There's a reason why the, the Torah uses this word. Uh, chance to be present. That's the second, the second uh, interpretation of this word is chance to be present. It's a, it's a chance thing. Like right? he caused he this, this thing just. So happened. It just happened, right? People say that outside. I don't know. I don't know how that happened. It just it just happened, you know. Um, you gotta be careful about saying that because this is actually Amalek's God. Uh, so if you keep yep, hap hap was happened unto. Uh, just uh, if you scroll down, there's even there's even different. There's all these different iterations of this word, but it says by chance I happened to be on the mount. Second Samuel, verse uh, chapter one, verse six. By chance I happened to be on the mount. It's the same word. Uh, by chance, right? By chance. It's like, what is, what is this whole chance thing? What? Why? Why is the Torah using this word? Because Amalek did not fear Hashem. He says that there is no God that controls the world. Everything is causality. Everything is just hap just happens to happen, right? Uh, so pull up now, verse. Now we're gonna see why why Haman is continuing into the footsteps of his ancestors so go to esther 3 chapter 3 of esther verse 5 uh it says when haman saw that mordecai would not kneel or bow low to him haman was filled with rage 
but he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai. He disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Having been told who Mordecai's people were, Haman plotted to do away with all the Jews, Mordecai's people throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus. And then the next verse, verse seven, in the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the 12th year of King Ahasuerus, poor, which means the lot, was cast before Haman concerning every day and every month until it fell on the 12th month, that is the month of Adar. So what Haman is actually doing here, he's actually saying, okay, when is it going to be the best time for me that it'll be the worst time for the Jews, right, historically? Mm. And so he's like, well, it's got to be the month of Adar, because why? Because that's that's, that is the month that that um, Moshe Rabbeinu, Allah HaShalom, passed away, right? May peace be upon him. Uh, so he figured, okay, since this, is the, this, since this is the month that they lost their Zadik, the righteous one, their leader, then this is the month that I should do it. So he was casting lives. He's like, this is going to be the best time for me because it's an unfortunate time for them, right? And again, he's not, he's not uh, thinking about anything else other than the scope of this happens to be when they experience the, their, their most misfortune, right? I was telling Amet earlier that that the it's actually interesting. So there's this comes from Borcha Chaim, and this is courtesy of Shlomo bin David from Strictly Torah. What verse in Borcha Chaim? Uh, on Genesis chapter one, verse two, Vahaaretz Taiha Tohu Vavohu. And there's, a, there's basically this whole drop about uh, darkness and the Yitzhahara, but that's not really, I, it's a beautiful drop. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the thing that stuck out to me was, in the, one of the footnotes says, the phrase, due to our, sin, due to our sins, is an idiom that is equivalent to the word, unfortunately. So when we use the word, unfortunately, it actually means due to our sins, right? And also, likewise, whenever we say uh, fortunate is the one, right, it's actually inclusive to mean somebody who has a lot of merit because of their, mit their mitzvot or some, some special mitzvah that they've done, right? Um, so all that to say, and I'm, I'm, that's really all I want to share, but all that to say that Haman didn't understand something, right? For one, he thought he thought everything just happens because it just happens. That's and that's really when you really break down Purim. Purim is called Purim because Haman casted lots, but Hashem was there controlling everything, right? That's that's literally the backdrop to Purim. Purim is a story in which God's name is not ever mentioned overtly, but yet He's there, moving the chess pieces, moving moving everything. Seemingly, um, I also shared this on Purim too, but that the, when you read the story of Purim, it actually takes place over nine years. We don't really read it that way because it seems like, oh, this must have happened, you know, within a couple of years. No, this, this story took place over nine, as a nine period year or nine year period story, right? And, um, but going back to Haman, he thought that, well, since everything just happens, and my God is the, is, is the God of happenstance, and they believe in this God of control, which I don't believe in, right? Then they're going to fall into my hands. I'll cast lots. I'll see which time is the most unfortunate time for them due to their sins, right? Which is, again, the, the, he believed in fortune, right? So this whole idea of fortune, when we, even, the, even today, people go to fortune tellers, right? But the idea, the rabbinic idiom, the rabbinic understanding of the word for fortunate or unfortunate is has to do with our sins or with our merits, right? If we merit something, then fortunate is that person. They're talking about that person's merit. They did a specific mitzvah and they merited to have something or, they, or Hashem just has a special chin on, on the person's life, like we see with Noah, right? Uh, Noah found, found favor in the eyes of Hashem, right? Um, so Sometimes Hashem just, just, you know, some people just have a, a special hen, which is what was also said about Esther, right? That she, 
she had, she had found favor in the eyes of Ahasuerus for some reason. But all that to say, he, he's got this, Haman's got this idea of, of fortune, right? And, but not in the, in the unkosher way possible that everything just happens, right? And um, the, the um, but the rabbinic understanding is, again, unfortunately means due to our sins, and fortunate is the mer the merit that we have, right? Uh, that we or potentially have. So, anyways, just wanted to share that. I, that that is, and really, it's the biggest the biggest underlying thing. in Purim is Purim is all about divine providence, Se unseemingly things being from Hashem. And the minute that we think that oh, this just happened to happen, well, we start thinking like Haman, hey, unfortunately, right? So we don't want us to let's not do that. <laughs> and let's know that the chef controls everything. He controls kings and kingship is his, right? We are a servant of Akadosh Baruch Hu, like we say in the Torah, Torah procession. So that was that was pretty eye-opening to me. I never I had never thought about that. Uh, because that word, how he met you on the way, like Hashem was alluding to that. Like Amalek, Amalek's God is the God of causality or happenstance, or he did, he doesn't fear me because he thinks every everything just happens, right? So, Baruch Hashem, this uh, you got to put in the uh, oh, so he wants book of Jewish thought volume two, divine providence. So this comes from Handbook of Jewish Thought, Divine Providence. It says, this is chapter 19. So this is from this book here. It says, God created the world for a purpose. As omnipotent and the omniscient, omniscient ruler of the universe, he therefore extends his providence to all things, overseeing them and maintaining them in a condition to fulfill his ultimate purpose. God therefore created the present world as a perfect place to fulfill his purpose with all nature under his command. The a causality resulting from the quantum nature of matter gives God the power to control events without altering his laws of nature. Therefore, even when God does not miraculously intervene in world happenings, as when they occur through the laws of nature by accident, or as a result of man's free will, all happenings ultimately result from God's will. So all that to say that Hashem still has everything under control, even if it doesn't seem like that. He doesn't have to miraculously do something to show that he's in control, right? And and and, that, and if you think about it, when you when you're, I don't know if anybody has ever seen anybody play poker, but the idea is to not show the person your hand. Right, so Hashem never reveals His hand to mm. to the other side. That's that's kind of way to look at this. Oh. Like He never reveals all His cards. Right, He doesn't put He's like, He knows what He's doing, and He knows what everybody. Else, the funny thing is, He He know He already knows what everybody else has too. Not that Hashem plays poker, but I'm just trying to give you an idea <laughs> of of how to think about this. Right, and uh, so, <laughs> but in Purim, He never shows His hand. He He you know. Esther gets taken, wow. and and Everything she's uh, she's in captive in the in the king's castle, and now she's you know with Achashverosh, and he's this non-Jew, but she's like this religious Jew. What is she doing, you know? Wow. And it's like Hashem's like, relax, like I need to get rid of Haman, you know. <laughs> so, and and it doesn't seem like that. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like that's what's going on. And even and even to the point where Esther has to actually say, okay, Jews, we need to fast, we need to make teshuva, we need to pray, and I'm going to be at the mercy of whatever king of Hajj, if I, if I die, I die, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, um, and that's, that's the beautiful story about Purim is, is that Hashem, Hashem was controlling everything, but if none of that would have happened, the, 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 shu, the level of teshuva that the Jews made during that time would have also not occurred, which also helped the salvation of all the Jews. There's another thing that that uh, Haman was counting on. So aside from him being him, him waiting for this perfect chance, right, to to destroy the Jews, he was he was also 
betting on the fact that they were not, that the, all the Jewish people were not in, in unity. So when he first tells, when, it, when he gets the king's, the king's ring and the king's signet, which by the way, when you read the verse, it says, it says the king gave the king. So there's a tradition that says, anytime you see the word the king in the Megillah, it's actually referring to Hashem, right? So when you read the, when it says King Ahasuerus, it's talking about King Ahasuerus. When you see, when you see the words the king, it's referring to Hashem, the king, right? But it, so it says the king gave the, the signet to Haman. So Hashem was already giving, giving power to Haman, right, during this time. And Haman then told King Ahasuerus, there is a, there is a nation among our nation Spread, spread throughout your kingdom that have a different set of laws. They're scattered about your kingdom, right? So there's a nation within your nation that's scattered throughout the, throughout the nation. So what he, what he meant by that was saying that the Jews are not, are not unified. They're scattered about your nation. They're, they're, they're spread apart. They're not even, they're not even together on, on, a, on a whole lot of list of things. But his, we see that the king, and when it says the king gave him the the, the, the signet ring, it was because that the Hashem, Hashem needed to get our attention, so he put someone like Haman in charge, right? And uh, we we see what happened, right? So, you know, Haman was just the stick, you know. Um, Check that out. Fourteen or fifteen. Talk about Hashem playing poker. Uh, this is what was happening Colossians with two fourteen. He wiped out the handwritten records of debts with the decrees against us, which was hostile to us. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. After disarming the principalities and powers, he made a public public spectacle of them, triumphing triumphing them, triumphing over them in the cross. So through the Akira of Yeshua, he was doing all of that. Okay. But that wasn't known. It looked like this man is getting beat. A uh, poor yeah. guy, not the Messiah. So yeah, good, good, bad. Yeah, Hashem is in control. I mean, um, that's that's the other that's the other lesson of Purim. The other lesson of Purim is okay, so on Yom on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is a day like Purim. What does that even mean? Uh means that Purim, Yom Kippur. Rabbi Mendel Kessler actually said it best. It's like we seemingly it seemingly seems like Purim is actually a, on a much higher level than Yom Kippur. How's how's that even possible? Right? We fast all day, we pray all day on Yom Kippur, but yet Purim is on a higher level. We don't even fast on we don't even fast on Purim. We fast the day before Purim. Yeah. And uh, so what's up? What's up with that? And he says he was saying that it's it's really this idea that or the idea is even even when things seem bad we see we can see Hashem even in Haman now not to get carried away and say that a Haman is a sham or anything weird like that but that Hashem was using Haman and Haman didn't even know he was being used right mm. same thing same thing like we see today uh you know how how do we go from Trump to Biden <laughs> you know not to get all political but it's like well Hashem, Hashem is using these, these, these individuals to, to enact a, a response out of us. Right Hashem, it doesn't get any worse, right? But, um, and hopefully we, we can already see the message, right? We can see not, uh, not necessarily the writing on the wall, but something, you know, something to that effect. Like, we already know what's happening, you know. Um, we did the Mourner's Cottage for, for Rob Chaim Kamnevsky. And there's, I, I forget the source text for this, but I think it's in Isaiah. I have to find the verse, but it basically says that when, the, when a righteous person passes away, you know, then, then people don't stop and think what that means, right? Now, this guy, I don't know if you know who this guy is. He's an amazing, he, he or Baruch Dine Met, he was a, a really, really genius rabbi. I've heard many stories about him. I got, I got his, uh, his commentary on Tehillim, which is pretty good. And one of the things is in there in the, in the introduction, it talks about like 
kind of his day-to-day routine. And one of his day-to-day routine was that anytime he heard, he heard somebody was in need of something, somebody, somebody was going through something like, uh, you know, somebody just had a car wreck or, you know, somebody else uh, doesn't, can't, can't get a baby, can't have, can't have babies or whatever it was. If some news got to him that some, some, something was, somebody was under some harsh decree and it reached him, what he would do is he would run to the Tehillim and recite to begin to, st- not, nobody even had to tell him to recite Tehillim. He just would run to Tehillim and recite to him. He said, bring me my Tehillim. I'm going to start reciting Tehillim on behalf of the, this person or these people or this group or whatever. There it goes. Isaiah 57, one, the righteous perish and no one takes it to heart. The devout are taken away and no one understands that the righteous are taken away to be spared from evil. Now, here's the thing. He just like this. That's what I'm saying. This is a big Zadik. Yeah, I don't know if y'all don't know who he is. I suggest you go find out about him because there's many, many great stories about him. But all that to say, he was considered it, it, the, he was considered the, the greatest of the generation. And that should scare us that Hashem decided that he, he said, hey, because we already know the righteous atone. Right. Hashem decided. It's time for atonement, and I, need, and I need to take you, the biggest zodiac of the generation. And how 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 are we paying attention, right? We've already we've already made the, the switch from from Trump to Biden, and now we have, you know, the passing of Rav Chaim Kamesky, and and uh, you know, hopefully we wake up. Hopefully, we don't have to get a a Haman with an evil decree before before we actually you know, have to truly re-experience something like porn again, right? So I'm not saying that to scare anybody. I'm just, you know, just to stop and think about that for a second. Um, you know, Hashem, Hashem is in control and he's he's doing a lot of things right now. So Brook Hashem. Hashem.